here um, for the folks on the line. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for being here. I'll do a quick intro, but um, hopefully leave most of our time for our speaker, uh, Neil. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, the Integrated Design Lab, we are a team of research faculty and students. We've got a uh, usually a, a rotating cast of students, um, some, some new mechanical engineers this fall that I'm really excited about. Um, but we're, we're university. We're here to be an educational resource for you all. Um, so if you have questions, um, come to us. We would love to do some research on it and help you basically enhance your, your jobs um, and, and allow you to do your energy modeling work even better. Um, which is what this GSOG is all about. So thank you to Idaho Power, we've got Chris and Andy here in the back who are providing lunch and sponsoring this lecture series where we can bring in um, really great speakers. We also have through Idaho Power, our energy resource library. So about 900 different tools free for you to check out for any project if you're trying to diagnose how a building is working. Um, and is it okay if I use you as an example? Yep, yeah, sure. Okay. We've got the flow meter that's heading out right now um, to check on water flow for uh, sizing a new hot water system. For a, so, if you need something like that, um, then you know, come to our, our website and just fill out an online form. It takes all of two minutes, and we'll get you on your way. So, um, please take advantage of that. It's a great resource. Uh, we've got our uh, ASAP today with Neil, so you know that it's already happening. And then coming up in October, I believe it's October 6th, um, is uh, Grasshopper and Rhino. Um, so we're excited about that. And then in November, it will be a joint session with Ashray. We also have our hybrid Lunch and Learn lecture series. So normally we'll come to your office and give a presentation. Um, but to reach a broader audience from time to time, we offer open webinars. So Dylan's giving one um, coming up on September 5th, uh, later this week, on luminaire level lighting controls. And if you're curious about those, um, you know, you can come upstairs to our office on the third floor. We've got them installed. You can walk around and play with the uh, remote, put the app on your phone, dial in the lights, um, and see how it actually works. So. Um, more information on that is available if you need, you know, your CEUs before the end of the year. And then on November 7th, um, Dr. Nassari, our research scientist, is going to be talking about existing building conditions. Um, go to our website, you can register there, um, come in person for lunch, um, or eat over your keyboard and get it all messy. We also have our technical design assistance program. This is also through Idaho Power. So if you have a project in Idaho Power service territory, we are a free helpline to you. So give us a call and we uh, don't bill you at all for that. Um, up to $2,000 worth of our time is funded by Idaho Power to just be an on-hand resource for you. So you don't have to worry about that. If it's gonna be a larger project where it's like a week or two of our time doing a daylight analysis or something like that, then um, we'll fill out a simple like one page scope of work, submit it to Idaho Power so they can make sure, yes, this is energy efficiency, this is um, in our commercial world, this is in our territory. Um, they'll get back to us in 48 hours and we can get to work on it right away. And it's a chance for our graduate students to really dive into real world practical problems um, and investigate things like how efficient are you know, photochromatic amazing in um, great. Um, and then if it's going to be a really big project where, once again, we're an educational resource coming into your lab, teaching your team how to do um, more, more energy modeling, a daylight analysis, a detailed walkthrough, design charrettes, working with the engineer. Um, then if it's, if it's $4,000 worth of our time or more, I don't know how wants to see that you've got a little skin in the game. Um, so there's a cost share but Idaho Power will still pay 75% of our time. So it's a really good deal, um, but you or the client would pay the other 25%. Um, they also have their other um, energy efficiency programs, including custom, um, and then the Flex Peak Command Response Program, and the Professional uh, Assistance Incentive to um, help compensate you, the designers, for your time 
on filling out some of those paperwork and applications. Um, Sheree is always emphasizing, make sure that you are submitting your applications very early because once construction is finished, you cannot get an incentive for it. The idea is to um, use these programs to um, you know, push efficiency within the state. So Chris, Andy, do you have anything you want to add? You can plug them afterwards if you keep on. I'll go ahead and stop sharing now so that Neil can get, uh, share his screen. We're really excited today, I am anyway, to have Neil Bolger. Um, he's the founder and principal at A2 Efficiency. He earned his bachelor's in mechanical engineering at Cal, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And for years, he's done pioneering work in energy modeling at Red Car and Indigo Group, and has contributed lots of educational materials to those learning energy modeling, which I really appreciate. I'm trying to teach that stuff. Um, so whether that's on Unmet Hours or YouTube or other blogs, you can find Neil's stuff there. Um, and I've appreciated that he's used his background in both engineering and graphic design to communicate clearly concepts and workflows that help people understand the systems they're modeling and designer, because um, it ends up being the places where we spend our lives. So Neil, thank you very much for your time today. Um, as somebody who struggled with modeling VRF in Open Studio today, I'm really excited to have this and have this recording and be able to reference it in the future. Um, for those in the room, I'm gonna mute so that um, you know you can crinkle your paper and eat your sandwiches in silence for those online. But if there's a question um, or something comes up, just let me know and I can unmute us. But Neil will also leave some time at the end for questions too. Indeed. All right. Thank you all again uh, for having me. Can you hear me there uh, clearly? All right. I will assume yes, unless I see hands waving. Um, and I would love to be there in person. I, I really thought about it, kind of came up last minute and uh, can't, can't make it there this time. But a big thank you to the Integrated Design Lab. Um, I was even thinking back from when I started energy modeling and engineering, just I would always use the IDL as a reference. There was some great material. There always has been uh, there. So it's, it's truly an honor to share with you all today. I sort of hold this, this institute with high regards. Um, and I see some colleagues I know in the room there eating, eating lunch. So it's a, it's a small world as always. Um, but VRF, so we're gonna talk today about demystifying VRF. Uh, I'll start my little timer here so I can stay on point. Um, Briefly about A2 efficiency, just a little background of, on how we got here. So we kind of play a bit in design consulting, helping projects be successful, understand their energy use. We do a bit of research as well as even technology studies. So uh, for better or worse, VRF has kind of followed me through all three of these different areas, which has been uh, very helpful, I would say, in each one. We've been able to research the technology, uh, study it in labs, and then go back to how we model it and say, is this, is this really working? Does this make sense? What am I not accounting for? So, um, but today what we're gonna run through is I'm gonna touch, I'll show you the learning objectives that we have for today. Uh, we'll do one slide on what is VRF and then we will dive a bit more into the mechanics of it. Uh, I'll share some trends driving usage that I think why it's being used. Not gonna spend a ton of time there, but I think it's always helpful. Um, it does tie into some of these system configurations, right? How does how do we configure with VRF as a design strategy? How does it integrate with other systems in the building? Um, and then we'll get into the component efficiencies. Um, and that's really where we can start to see almost like the one for one. What are we defining in an energy model? What are we defining in the component that we're selecting? And then we'll do, we'll run through this example building I have. Um, well, a little bit of sort of the, the baking show trick, I'll show you the results. We're not gonna open the software hopefully uh, in 50 minutes, but, um, and this this is sort of an introduction to the whole thing. So if you don't use Open Studio 2, you should be able to get something out of it on how to design and think about VRF as a system to make it efficient. Uh, though I will definitely tie it into like how you can then account for that in your software. So. All right, so I shared these, they were kind of in the, the intro to the, the meeting, but we're going to learn about typical configurations of VRF, uh, learn about how much energy used to anticipate for different systems, heating, cooling fans, uh, learn about how to create that system in Open Studio, and then learn a bit about how to specify details so you can match your specific application or even help a client arrive at a design if they don't quite know how to apply it in an efficient way. So. 
All right, so what is VRF? So uh, variable refrigerant flow or variable refrigerant volume is some sometimes another term that's referred to for these products. Uh, it's a type of pumped refrigerant. So we're moving refrigerant around a building. There's outdoor compressors that will often be where the refrigerant is made very cold or very hot, and then it's pumped through insulated pipes into the building, either as a liquid or a gas uh, to different rooms. Almost all VRF systems are variable speed inverter driven compressors. Uh, that's kind of the critical piece that makes these efficient, that sort of puts them out ahead of other heat pump products on the market. There are definitely inverter heat pumps in other products, but almost all of VRF is inverter driven. So that results in really good efficiencies at part load operations. You can run those compressors at part load speed. You have these outdoor compressors and coils that have lots of surface area. And so VRF can kind of optimize how the refrigerant system is running. It can take advantage of those large surface areas, change the pressures and the temperatures of the refrigerant that it's compressing and pumping, and therefore like get, squeeze some efficiency out of these systems. So um, we'll look a little bit more at some inside pictures here in a second. Um, they can work in heating and cooling. Uh, you can definitely buy these where they only do heating or cooling. A lot of projects tend to use the ones that can do simultaneous heating and cooling. So you're using both the hot refrigerant and the cold refrigerant to heat and cool different rooms in a building. Uh, but that's another advantage that oftentimes is put forward as uh, a functionality of VRF that's uh, really attractive. It really just gives a lot of flexibility too, right, to buildings. So why we see VRF used frequently, these are my opinions, I should just preface that. Uh, so this is not market research by any means, just uh, what I have seen uh, in the work I practice. Um, so the first one is just, it's highly compact, right? Space efficiency. This is a 400,000 square foot office building in Utah. Maybe it should not have used air source VRF, but they did decide to use air source VRF. Um, and you can just see, right, this is the entire footprint of the outside air unit and then all the VRF compressors on this roof of each building, taking up like a quarter of each roof. So pretty space efficient, even on the outside, they were able to get a ton of solar then on the roof. Uh, same on the inside, right, you can put these in a lot of spaces. This is an existing retrofit building in Oakland. They were able to line the existing corridors with a bunch of these fan cassettes. Um, you can even see the outside air kind of ducted in this small duct. So able to add air conditioning in a building that didn't have air conditioning before. It only had a boiler. They needed to put something in, and this was able to sort of meet their space constraints. Um, so a, a lot of flexibility, and that's often you know what we see. Um, op big options, though, right? Large rooms. This is just a ducted fan coil shoved up in the ceiling, serving a large open office space uh, in a three-story office building in Sacramento. So again, kind of it, it's flexible and that really drives a lot of value, especially in the architecture realm when they're trying to work within constraints of making the building work and the space and, and a lot of other aspects. So um, another benefit that sometimes is taken for granted, all-in-one controls. For better or worse, it comes with the controls that that manufacturer made. Uh, for small buildings, this can be a big deal. It just sort of takes out that little bit of confusion on Will this controller work well with this HVAC system? Um, we generally know that you know, the LG system will work well with the LG controller. Conversely, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi, right, Daikin. Uh, but that's a big deal for different building types, knowing like it will all work. Um, and then lastly, it's an all electric option. It's sort of been the front runner for a long time as buildings look to be all electric, be net zero. It's been around, it's sort of proven to work, um, again, a four story, that's your office building in Colorado that used ground source VRF uh, to do that. So. Um, I did say I, it's not without its challenges, right? Pumping refrigerant, refrigerant is not the best, especially when we think about global warming. Um, so refrigerated systems are definitely gonna be up against challenges in the next decade here. Uh, but there's a lot of innovation happening. There's a lot changing on the types of refrigerant. Uh, just showing a showcase here that Mitsubishi has made this hybrid system where it connects refrigerant to a, a branch connector that then uses water throughout the building. Um, I never thought that VRF would be the solution that gets us to air to water heat pumps, but it might, it might be the way we get there. Uh, it's, but essentially the same kit of parts, if you think about how we're installing and designing with it. Okay, 
so what makes VRF efficient? Um, and we're going to talk a bit about three different areas that I kind of categorized here. Um, we're going to touch on ventilation and how configuring VRF with the source of ventilation, the path of ventilation can make a, a big impact on efficiency. We'll talk about the system criteria itself. So things like refrigerant line lengths and other aspects of controls that are just good to be aware of. Even if we don't have full control over it, you can definitely work to lay out systems and pick them in certain ways that makes them more efficient. And then the actual component criteria, what is the information we might get from the different uh, components of the system once we've picked it or as we pick it to make it efficient, the, the EER, the COP, the fan pressure, things that would directly go into the model. Um, all of this will go into the model as you can imagine, but certain elements sort of take, take precedent, right? How we configure ventilation, that might be a, a very early on choice if you're considering putting the system in a building on how to do it. Um, so this slide has a lot of different configurations. We've kind of grown it over the years as we've seen different people design with VRF. Uh, but the point of this is, is looking at like how the ventilation connects to that VRF fan coil and then the room can be rather impactful on fan energy uh, for these different configurations. So uh, we'll have another concept diagram, but in some more mild parts of California, we've even seen some very small schools just directly duct outside air to that unit. It runs all the time. It has to heat and cool all the air. Uh, it will not work in super cold climates, but it's very affordable, right? Very affordable. It also uses a lot of energy. Um, functionally, we've seen these other configurations also that we kind of call coupled ventilation. Air is supplied to the back of the fan coil or near it in a plenum. And again, that fan, to keep the ventilation in the space has to stay on at some level uh, of operations to make sure fresh air comes in. Uh, the really efficient ones are where we can configure fresh air to come in regardless of when that fan coil runs. So allowing that fan coil to be configured so it could cycle all the way off uh, or at least to a really low speed. Um, and that can be a challenge, right? You sometimes need to precondition the air so it doesn't get so cold in the winter or it be too hot in the summer. Uh, but the solutions that can do that, you'll see really can benefit from, from changing their fan energy equation. So how it's configured makes a big difference. Um, and just some proof, this is some field data where the main key takeaway, the TAN, these are, each site is a different field site. The TAN number is those VRF fan coils. And I've highlighted ones that were decoupled and you can see the EUI of the fan coils is a third of the other sites that even where we had a few with DCV, uh, this is like classroom building, it didn't get as low as a fully decoupled system where if there's no heating and cooling, the fan coil just goes off. So. All right, so that's something to consider, right? Like how we configure it. Um, the next thing that I think is, is always a challenge is there's these metrics, right? These full load efficiency, EER, and then oh, I even wrote full load on both. Huh? What a, what a problem that is. Okay, part load, this should say part load efficiency, IER. Um, and I know as, as a designer for years, I was moving so fast, I was like, I know that IER is higher. I know it's something about part load efficiency, but I'm not really sure what, what it means. Um, it's really made up of a test where they have to say at different capacities, how efficient is it? And then it weights those and says, well, we know these systems are mostly gonna run at about 60% capacity. Uh, or 60% of the time they'll be at that. Um, but from a modeler, you might get a very high EER sticker value. And in some ways it doesn't really help you model that system. Uh, on a model, you really, you're stuck with a set of performance curves over studying systems in the field. We found these to be somewhat conservative. They're reasonably efficient. They're not as efficient as you might see the relationship of an EER to an IER product. You can definitely buy products that are higher but as a modeler, you just plug in that one efficiency at 100%, I do 11.7 EER. And these curves, which most modeling software will use the curves from the Florida Solar Energy Center, uh, give you that part load efficiency. So they say at half speed, at a different temperature, I can get a 20 EER out of the product um, instead of 11.7. So just something to know, right? Like as we make models, we're not going to you can pick different curve sets, but most of the models I've seen, and we should probably all stick to, to one curve set unless it's really well defined. Um, 
but that's something to think about. Um, okay, so some other some other key things that, thinking about how to lay out VRF systems and what can drive efficiency. And, and these next ones I'll touch on don't really show up in the modeling per se. It's more just what can drive overall efficiency. And there are some inputs in the software, but it's more just best practices. So, so pipe length, excessive pipe length. Some of these products, they say you could run 300 feet. It's really good to think about pipe length, kind of like you would think about static pressure in an air duct system. Um, and that you don't want one run that's so long compared to all the other ones. You can certainly run VRF pretty far, though the longest pipe length is going to dictate the temperature that system runs at, how hard the compressor works, the pressure needed to push all the way through that pipe. Um, and that's why you'll see kind of VRF distributed around big buildings. They won't just make one central thing that runs very far. Um, so something to be aware of. Uh, same is true on simultaneous heating and cooling. This is something that VRF really promotes, right? We can do both at the same time. I would really push to like minimize the need to rely on that. It's certainly a nice fallback and certainly there if needed. Though when we look under the hood at the mechanics of how the refrigeration process works, if we have to heat and cool at the same time, we need that compressor to be working its hardest. We need it to make the hottest refrigerant it can for the zones in heating, and then the coldest it needs for the zone in cooling. And that can actually make the compressor use more energy or operate at a less efficient point than if we just had a better envelope that might reduce the challenges of, of simultaneous heating and cooling. A lot of that occurs when we have a poorly insulated envelope where we have single pane windows. Um, so, it's there, but I would actually reverse the, the general design theory and say like, try to minimize it, but uh, use it as a backup. Uh, and then the last thing that's kind of a function of VRF is there are a lot of control options and different manufacturers call it eco mode or economy mode. Um, and I would say this really is something that should be focused on, it has to be for the right applications, but especially in a climate like Idaho where it's drier, the ability for the system to relax its refrigerant temperatures and not operate at the extremes when it has to is really the, the magic that saves a lot of energy. So even having that configured when a system is installed can be critical. Um, certainly something to think about if you need a space to always dehumidify at a certain temperature, you may not be able to do this mode, but it's something that gets overlooked quite a bit and can end up being a big differentiator between field performance and modeled performance. Uh, and we could probably get lost in the weeds on these little tables, but this is just showing some examples of how at, it uses this table if the setting is configured. It will look at the room temperature and change its cooling numbers and change its heating numbers. And again, kind of moving how that compressor works to be more efficient. Okay. But it, let's get into the mechanics a little bit. So now we're going into like the components. What can we actually define in the components um, and then even represent those in the model? So at the compressor, at the outdoor unit level, we have efficiency, the heating and cooling efficiencies. We have the ability to say, is it able to do simultaneous heating and cooling? Can we move heat around the building? Um, a lot of information can be defined and needs to be thought about for defrost. Does the unit reverse its compressor? Does it do that and have some electric resistance component? Does it do one or the other? Um, the number of compressors in the box, a lot of these systems come in modules and you open that up and it's just made of smaller modules. So a 20 ton unit is just four or five ton units. And, um, but it matters, right? So you can change these properties both in how you pick it and how you model it. You can say, I have three compressors. The lowest turn down of all of them is 25%. Um, and then you can't even define the refrigerant pipe length. The model input tends to not change the results dramatically. It's there, you can play with it and specify it as best you can. Uh, we found that it's more, uh, the real performance and pipe length is, is really where it drives the results today. But, but those are kind of the things we're thinking about, right, with the main compressor. Um, on the fan coil, we're thinking more about the type of fan coil. And I'll even say like, that's a very like energy modeling specific thing. Like in almost all actual VRF fan coils or cassettes, almost all of them have 
three speeds or more settings to them. In the modeling software, we end up having to pick an object that represents that fan. So either an on-off cycling fan where it's 100% or it's 0%. There's now these multi-speed fans that I'm a big fan of where you can use that fan and then say, what are my speeds? Or do I have a continuously changing speed? Can I use a curve like I would with a VFD and be at any speed that's needed? Um, and that gives a little bit more control and a little bit more a realistic performance that we'll see uh, to how much energy it takes to run the heating and cooling system. Um, outdoor air. So again, in the software and in reality, you can say, I want the outdoor air to come straight to the fan coil, or I want it to be supplied by a separate device. Um, you can configure that in the software we'll look at. Um, the control again. So is it coupled to ventilation? Does it always need to be on? Can it always be off and only turn on? when there's a request. And then the classic, like what's the pressure design? What's the efficiency of my product um, to represent it? Um, and lastly, I have one slide. So the DOAS unit, if you do have decked it outside air, does it have heat recovery? Again, how is the fan powered? Is it controlled? A lot of these systems, uh, even in multifamily, right? You might have balanced ventilation with an HRV or an ERV. Um, it might just be on at constant volume quite often. Uh, you can definitely get more detailed into these. You could add zone control, DCV controls, um, but trying to think what can we do in the design and what can we represent in the model? There's a lot of other trainings I've done on DOAS controls um, and I linked to some in the end, but critical to efficiency. All right, we're doing pretty good. Okay, so we're gonna look at this small office building. Um, this is a, two-story building that we were potentially going to monitor and research in our project and went so far as to make a model. And then we didn't monitor the building at all, but I had this model sitting there and it's very nice. Um, and so I used it for this. I've been working on it for the last couple of days to try and make some examples for you all on if we were to apply different systems to this building, what's the result? You know, We've kind of looked at how we can configure the outside air coming in, how we can control the system, and I wanted to use this model to kind of step th through that exercise to look at what's the impact on energy use that we could anticipate. Um, for the demonstration purposes, I made 15 zones. Um, it's mostly broken up. Uh, we'll look at the space type mix in a second here, but on the second floor, it's a lot of like private conference rooms. And then this is like a suite of offices in reality, we might find that each one of these is its own fan cassette in each office, but for, for speed of modeling and the fact that they all do the same thing and they all face the same direction, I just made them one zone, uh, just to give you a sense of our building. Um, I did put it in Boise. Uh, it is an existing building, so we stuck with the, the envelope that they had built up over time, which was more of a, a mass wall that had decent insulation, a, a Lower insulated roof, R25, some some decent windows, not not the best windows, but again, kind of what we've seen. This is a, a building that's built in California, so it's a it's pretty typical for a 2001 construction building. Um, a lot of open space, a lot of corridor space, kind of between rooms. There's a shaft, I think, in the building that's this no space type that I assigned here. Uh, all right, but we're gonna walk through if we apply different systems to this building, what are the results we could get out of it? So uh, this first system we're gonna look at is, and I, I realized we, we put, well, walk through it anyway. So it's just ducting outside air to the fan coil. So in this configuration, I realized I put this building in Boise, it probably wouldn't actually work in reality. You would need a little heater on the inlet of that air. The model still will run and just squeeze more heating out of this fan coil for, for purposes of demonstration. Um, but this is, like I shared before, been done in certain buildings where they're really cutting costs and trying to find ways to, to make it all fit. Um, I guess some benefits to this configuration is there's no additional DOAS fan, right? It's only that fan working. It has to pull the air through that duct, but it's a much, much smaller design. Uh, but we have the fans always have to run because they need to be there, the pathway, the fresh air makes it into the building. Um, there's there's additional pressure drop I mentioned, and there's no heat recovery. So um, in the software, 
when we look in Open Studio, there's this special little universe for VRF where you can make a system and then you make these fan coils. And what we've basically done is we've said for each fan coil, it has the option to bring in outside air in every mode, cooling, heating, or when there is no cooling and heating. And so we've left that and said, let's auto size. Tell me what I need to do. And that will look at the room and say, it's an office. It needs this much fresh air. So that enables that direct air to come into the zone. If we don't have that, and we'll see this in one of the DOAS cases, we would set these all to zero. And that would tell the unit, I'm only here for heating and cooling. I don't need to worry about conditioning a certain amount of ventilation air. So this is also configured with just an on-off fan, which is like the default fan coil type in Open Studio when you have the HVAC library and it's configured always on. So we've put in some additional pressure just to pull in the outside air. Um, and we'll look at the summary of efficiencies at the end. I have a little table of each configuration. Uh, we'll look at that at the end. Okay, so in our, in our building here, what that results in is a little bit of cooling, right? We have a little hot in that little summer window, a lot of heating, 9.9 .9 EUI. This is KBTUs per square foot. And then a lot of fan energy, 8.2 uh, EUI for the VRF fans. And again, driven by the need to always have them running in some way. If we were to add this makeup air unit uh, and just duct in the outside air, not necessarily even treat the outside air, just bring it into the building. Uh, what this does, why I did this in the model is I really wanted to use these multi-speed fans and I also wanted to ensure I was getting enough fresh air into the building. Um, I did try and do a run with only the multi-speed fans ducting the outside air to the software and it did not work for me. Um, there's probably more systems needed, but the outside air when I only did that would drop below the minimum ventilation. In this configuration, the outside air was always satisfied. I was always making sure I hit the minimum amount I needed and my fan coils could go all the way up to their three speeds and then all the way down to a lower speed. So to do this, I've changed the fan type. So I've changed the fan inside the model to be this modular fan and said, I want discrete steps of power control. I wanna do a low, medium, high. Um, and I know these are in a published report somewhere, but we did a bunch of field measurements where we went out and measured some fan cassettes, some fan coils at different, at their speed ratings, because it's very hard to find published data just to make this curve. So we could say that how low is low. So manufacturers will publish the airflow of their lowest speed. It's very hard to find the power rating because it's very directly linked to a design. Um, but it, this was the curve we made after looking at several sites and several fan coils. Most fan coils will not turn down below 70% uh, speed was the lowest we found in lots of them and at about 50% power. It's not as much turn down as you might get in other variable capacity fans, but it's definitely something. It's half the power of full flow um, and you'll see that in the energy. So when you do this, our fan energy is, uh, you know, almost half, right? The VRF energy for the fan coils is now four and a half. We've added some DOAS fan energy. That's pretty low because there's no heat recovery device to go over. So it wasn't, it just had a filter in that, in that makeup air unit. But um, you can see we've already kind of trended down in the amount of fan energy uh, needed. We keep going. If we had a dedicated outside air system, we're now recovering heat, take some more pressure. We got a put a bigger fan on the DOAS unit, push the air through that system. Um, so we've now built this system out, right? We've added heat recovery to the model. We've configured it to a, this model's configured to a very basic set point. It's just always trying to hit 62 degrees delivered to the space. Um, and you could go into some bit more modeling on if you wanted to do some preconditioning or, or avoid it's very cold conditions. Uh, today, I kind of left it basic. Uh, but when we do that, we see the same step change, right? So we anticipate the fans are doing the same thing. They're still three-speed, multi-speed fans. So we get about the same. The DOAS now is doing more fan energy, has to push through the heat recovery device. But we, we make up for it in our heating savings. 
All right. Um, and then lastly, uh, the system that is is certainly hard to engineer as much as I like it for efficiency. I, I do respect the challenge of, uh, I guess what's overly expressed in this diagram of trying to ventilate a room with dedicated decoupled air. So trying to bring the fresh air in and having enough space to put all those different registers in the ceiling of each room. Right? You need fresh air in, fresh air out, cooling in, cooling out. Uh, but you get a lot of performance, right? We can now let those fan coils turn on and off. Uh, we still have our heat recovery device. Uh, it has pressure to run. Um, so now we've sort of changed in the software. There's a setting that says, what is the default supply air fan operating mode? So this is a fundamental input of the whole fan coil in the software. And you can, by default, it's set to always on or always available. Um, and you can change that to say, no, I always want you to default to off. Only if there's a request for heating or cooling can you turn on. But by and large, you should only turn on for those requests. And at that point, too, you should only be at the speed you need to be at, medium speed, low speed, uh, for the load in the space. So when we do that, uh, we can see our, our Vera fan energy almost goes uh, to nothing, right? Less than one. Kind of what we saw in, in those field demonstrations I showed. Um, strangely enough, or not strangely enough, but uh, it, it always looks strange at first and then I think about it more. So that fan energy was turning into fan heat. And so now we need to make up some of that heat. We need to run the compressors a bit more. There wasn't, there's not any free heat from the fans entering our rooms. Um, but sort of the pathway to low energy. So through this, we, yeah, also the pathway to low energy. Um, some of the, the summary inputs of what we did. So just kind of to, to recap there. So we started with a, a VRF only system and it has a little bit more fan power, 0.5 watts of CFM. Um, it's very hard to sort of pick a number that is average. You might find many, the ones that are not ducted, very low. Ones that are ducted might be this or higher, but that's what we were looking at. That's the numbers we saw the high energy use was if we had single speed fans and they had ventilation delivered, you get really bad performance. Kind of makes sense. We're almost modeling something that doesn't exist. We're modeling a, an energy model that's always at 100% airflow, even if it might have some modulating capacity. We saw probably more realistic answer for what VRF would look like, even if it had ducted outside air to it, would be this three speed fan control a little less pressure because now we have another fan providing power. Um, and then the same as we step through this, right? We're, we're adding heat recovery, increasing the DOS fan pressure, and then it, lastly, decoupling those fans, letting them cycle. Uh, hey, Neil, uh, yeah. we got a question online. <clears throat> uh, yeah. The question is, so the model assumes there is no simultaneous cooling and heating. Is there a way to model simultaneous uh, cooling and heating? I think, sorry, I, I did skip that. We did turn that on. And actually I did put two VRF systems in. So there's one per floor in this model. I kind of went over that a little quick. Um, and there is, I, I don't have a screenshot, but that is a toggle at the highest level. At the compressor level, you say, what's my COP? How do I control defrost? Do I have simultaneous heating and cooling? And so, you can turn that on there. If you don't have it, it's going to ask, it's going to look for the majority of the rooms. It's going to sacrifice the ones that aren't heating when they need some. But this model did have it. So that's sort of shown in this stack to begin with. It would be a very hard thing to try and tease out how you would not have simultaneous heating and cooling in the model. You would have to, to avoid rooms that had unmet hours. You would need to almost compare like multiple VRF systems to one. Uh, yeah, sorry, I skipped that. That's a great question. So. Uh, all right. Um, all right, so that's, and we can take some more questions, but that's generally like the, the example I wanted to run through here. Uh, I would say some key takeaways are that Efficient VRF requires a good design, not just the model. You can definitely represent key things, though some of what will drive efficiency is really hard to put in the model. Uh, 
the pipe length item, hard to represent. The refrigerant temperatures that are kind of driven by long pipe runs or poorly configured controls, it would it can somewhat be seen in the IER metric, but again, in the model, we're really using the full load efficiency and just assuming those curves represent the right part load. If we really have poor controls, you'll almost see the system run at flat efficiency. So it'll if you have controls configured at like set heating and cooling set points for the compressor, it'll just be 11 EER forever. So that's where you might end up having a model that says you should get savings. You might find your field site missed that toggle and it's not getting the savings they expected. So it can be a tricky system for sure. Um, as I uh, touched on, go ahead. Neil, if I can interrupt you, uh, there's a yeah. follow-up to the last question. Uh, do we need to adjust the supply air temperature set point in that case? Uh, it looks like we're providing only 62F to the zones. In So that's for the outside air. So in the VRF system, you actually don't get the control in Open Studio to dictate the supplier temperature of the coils. So that, that input there is really to provide neutral air. You could definitely adjust it to be more seasonal, try and do a little bit of free cooling in the summer, a little more heat recovery in the winter. A lot of smaller HRVs and ERVs will have very different range of options that you can do on, on DOAS control. So I would encourage it, but I would also not hold your breath that you're going to find a product that will give you amazing control of the DOAS. On VRF, let's see if we have an HVAC system. We could bring it up, but yeah, you're really, the user is almost given no control. I don't even think you are given control. You can say the capacity of the coil. You can say the airflow that it's rated at. And the, you can dictate the sensible heat ratio. So if you do, as a user know, this product was specified at 80%, where 20% of my cooling is moisture removing. But beyond that, you can't actually control how Open Studio models set point control of the VRF. It's just done behind the scenes. It's the only system in, in the software that's sort of this unique animal. Um, uh, we got a, another question, Neil. Yeah. Uh, how does adding DOAS change the sizing and related design of the VRF fan coils? Uh, what changes to performance curves would need to happen? Um, I don't know if I would change the performance curves of the products. I think that would take the, the curves that were used, right, were built off reviewing engineering data from several different VRF manufacturers to try and figure out like how do these units perform at different wet bulb temperatures, outdoor temperatures. When you do have a dedicated outside air system that serves your building, it certainly can impact the size of the coils. And I think in the software, you can't even say like, should my unit account for that and downsize the fan coil? Um, it's always good to check though. A lot of designers won't, they'll assume they'll size it anyway. So it, it goes back and forth, but the, the size of the coil and then its performance in the software from my experience has, if it's 20% larger, I have not seen strong differences in how that fan coil performs. Um, in reality, you have to buy a larger fan coil, it's 20% more. So oftentimes whether or not to downsize has become a cost question how do we really rely on the HRV? Do we have faith that it's going to work? What are we using? Um, so I've seen it more impactful on the architecture and the engineering of the system to get it installed and less so on like the software giving wildly different answers. If it's, con if it's plumbed in the software the right way, you should get similar answers. And I don't know if I would, you could definitely consider if you would change the curves, I guess. It's probably better to think of if you have a DOS unit that really can control moisture and you have, and it's a DX DOS, let's say it's, it's able to dehumidify and heat the air as needed. You certainly in the software could change the fan coils sensible heat ratio and say it does less, say it does more sensible heat and less latent. You might see some differences in performance, but um, 
it's definitely hard to change. If you were to re-engineer the curves, I, I think that would take a concerted effort and perhaps be more than one project. It would need to be more of like a manufacturer um, specific. Um, I can definitely take more questions because I did want to say, you know, this is kind of my, my summary slide here of, of what can be driven by more efficiencies. And I have some links we can share after this too of uh, different design guides we've done that a lot of our research has been around DOAS, but all of those systems by and large used VRF. And so we studied a lot of VRF performance as well uh, through those. And the last one, the last one down here was some work we did that my colleague put together about, um, we helped as part of the, the test procedure for VRF systems. And it gets a bit more into the weeds on the refrigerant test set points and, and pressures and things like that. So. Any other questions? Uh, I'm not seeing online. Uh, do we have any in the room? Eric? I don't think I can hear the room. Uh, we got one. Uh, how much is leakage a concern for VRF? Yeah, it's definitely a, a tough question. There's definitely, um, I, I would say it's a, a high concern from what I've seen in the industry. It's it's very hard to like pinpoint data and all the research we've done on trying to find data sources. <laughs> it basically, all the data we found says it, it doesn't leak at all. And then we hear stories from universities where during installation, <laughs> they leaked all the refrigerant. So um, I, I think it's, I think it's certainly of concern and certainly of concern, it sort of leans into like the quality of the installation. Uh, and I think that's why we see such a great push towards changing the refrigerants just for that concern in case. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I don't know if, it, I, yeah, I'm concerned with it, but I, I don't know how much it's uh, yeah. been quantified. But. I uh, follow up to that because we've done field testing for residential and, and VRF systems and our clients are always asking for us to measure refrigerant leakage, which is very challenging to do. But what we've done is measured it the way before and after. And in general, almost every installation was zero, except for a few of the bad ones, which was a lot, like half. And so it probably averages out to somewhere between that when you're looking at you know a bunch of installations in the industry. So I think it is important to consider that. Well, moving with A2Ls, so we're going to have to have refrigerant monitoring on every single system. So we'll know immediately when it leaks, yeah. shuts it down. Yeah, and that's definitely, we've heard a lot too that like the, the switched A2Ls is is not cheap, right? The, some no. estimate like the, the cost might add 30% to a VRF system just to add that little monitor it's not on, just on each end. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's the sensors on each cassette. So I can, and I think, who knows, but that's partially why I think we may see those like hydro split systems more. Yeah. It's definitely different, but takes a lot of that cost and puts it somewhere else. Um, yeah. Any other? yeah, I wanted to ask what the different uh, ventilation distribution configurations, like what drives those different choices and uh, like how frequent or do you find the different configurations? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question here. Uh, let's see, I can almost go back to this. Um, a lot of it is, a lot of it comes down to like engineers risk tolerance is really the challenge I've, I've hit. Um, in a lot of jobs where I am not the engineer <laughs> record, which is most, it's really ensuring that the, the engineer who is the engineer record and then even the client understand that you can make a comfortable decoupled system work. A lot of the jobs I've seen will just default to one of these ducted to the back of the unit or ducted to a plenum. And it's a little driven by cost because it is cheaper. You have less holes to put in the ceiling. Um, you also potentially have less duct because you're just ducting to a plenum. 
But then the pushback I often receive is that if we don't do this, we might end up with a risk. We might dump cold air all over people. And what if, what if they're uncomfortable? I don't want to do it. Um, so that's been a big challenge. And I think one that uh, sort of makes the case for better heat recovery in a lot of scenarios, that if we had that, we create this, this neutral. Uh, but that's been, so yeah, it's kind of driven a little bit by engineer risk and the owner not really understanding. Um, and I think too, like for the longest time, we had very poor data on fan coils. It took me over like eight years of trying to measure fan coils to finally get enough data to say, oh my gosh, these little tiny fans all add up to something substantial. Because <laughs> uh, forever we'd say, oh, they're small. They're so small. They're, how could they be? How could they be bad? Let's just let, let it run. Uh, so I think knowledge is power. I think we're finally moving a bit. But... So yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, almost we measured we had to do field trials of like, and Jordan, I'm sure has more sites, but like 13 sites. And I think three of them were decoupled, right? So it's not the common, um, even that large building in Utah, that was a coupled system for those same concerns that the engineer had. So. Neil, I think you mentioned that on the fan coil side, you just have it <clears throat> auto sized. Do the same thing on like the outdoor unit on the compressor. Um, we will early on. I mean, I would say if you had, if you actually know the size of your outdoor unit, it's probably best to size the outdoor compressors and put in the exact number <laughs> of compressors because you can you can do capacity, number of compressors, and then overall turn down, and those are pretty important and specific. The indoor fan coil is probably best to auto size. Like even in VAV reheat systems, it's usually best to let the model size the reheat coil. It's just, there's so many nuances that might be different about how you zoned your model compared to how many attributes are in the actual VAV box. Um, so I think that kind of is the truth for VRF2. Like when you get down to zone capacities, maybe care a little bit less about being specific and focus more on ratios. Is it the right? fan power to airflow? Is it the right turn down ratio? Is there, is it the right sensible heat ratio? Um, things like that, the fan coil. So. I, I imagine a a, a, in a high desert climate like Boise, I imagine that you probably got a pretty decent uh, difference in max capacity, uh, design capacity, depending on whether you had the DOAS unit um, serving the ventilation load or the VRF system when you're, when you're piping it in. And with so many, so many thousands of hours in kind of that 25% to 75% range, that could have a really big impact on the efficiency of the compressor if you're now oversizing and effectively mm. sitting at that 11 IER and cycling so often if you're oversizing so much to fully meet the ventilation load with the, with the, with the VRF. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a really good point. Cause yeah, it's, it's certainly a more forgiving system at part load, but it's not, you know, it's not perfect, right? Even at low loads, it will still drive back towards inefficiencies, just like any compressor based system. So it's probably more forgiving than other types of HVAC on oversizing and having that extra capacity. But yeah, it's always good to do a, a good calc and aim for, uh, yeah, 750 square foot a ton, right? Try and get the most out of these systems we can. Um, be interesting to see how much impact it has on efficiency and how many unmet hours it would be to just say, you know, let's size it as if we're not doing the ventilation load at all on the VRF. Yeah. Even if you are, and then see, okay, here's the impact on energy usage and number of unmet hours. Like, are the spaces getting the 65 or are they just sitting at 67 instead of 68 or, or 70? Yeah. Yeah. Have you looked at the pairing of VRF to central AC systems like custom coils with air handlers that have outside air louvers, basically centralizing everything to that air handler? You seen those? Oh, you mean where the VRF is in the air handler or? Yeah, Norman S. Wright does it a bunch. In, are you in Southern or Northern California? Uh, Northern California, but I've certainly seen yeah. uh, a large, yeah, we've, <laughs> 
on several like custom dust units, I've seen like the bank of LG units lined and then the refrigerant coil. I think it's definitely a, a creative solution to getting a heat pump into a air handler that is more controllable for sure. So um, it can work. I would say it's probably best uh, overall, even before I've seen that configured, I know years going back working in India, that like DX by a principle is like a terrible controller of moisture a lot of times, unless it's really like a, a DOAS unit now, I guess is engineered to have lots of coils, but for years we would only do water coils if it was really humid. So I think California West Coast Idaho kind of gets away with a lot because we can just put those in and they, they work pretty good. Um, We'd have to add a specific hot gas reheat coil basically. So it's own little system with a thin one or two row coil yeah, on the lead yeah. on your side. So it's it expensive, but it's a cool way around fan coils everywhere. It's true. Yeah. And you get a lot of that yeah, part load efficiency out of the, out of the unit. So, and a lot more control than you would get out of a packaged heat pump. I know that's the challenge I've seen with trying to get the cost. They only go the... so big too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And that, that one is a tricky one. I don't quite know if in open studio, you, you probably would struggle to model that. I don't know of a great way. Um, in other software like IES, you actually can say this coil is a VRF coil, even though it's in an air handler, and it will yeah. use the curves uh, from that same product. But it, it's definitely starting to get into a little different areas. Yeah, in Open Studio, you can actually put the VRF terminal unit on the supply side of an air loop, which would be yeah. like that solution. Right. 